Happy Monday. Welcome, everyone. You know, we are down to the wire on Mercury retrograde, and I am ecstatic about that because, you know, last week I had to go to a friend's house to do the show because my internet was down for five days. And then I came home from yoga this morning, and guess what? A fire truck had come down my street and knocked my cable out, meaning that my internet was out. But luckily, the fire people have more pull with Comcast than I do. They told him it was a safety hazard, and so they actually were able to get it fixed in time for the show. I had a backup plan. I was going to go to my neighbor's house, but here we are, and I'm just happy to be with you all. I've got a really good show, and it's going to be very interesting, I believe, on tap for you tonight. My guest is Joe McQuillan. He's an author, and um, he's a father. And that's probably the big piece of this because he lost his son tragically some years ago. And um, that set him off on a quest to try to find his son again, to get, get some answers that he didn't have, to get some closure and some healing. And he's written a book about it. So welcome, Joe McQuillan. Thank you very much. So, you know, I can't even imagine what it would be like to lose a child. You know, that's something that we're never really meant to deal with is, you know, our kids passing before we do. And it, it happened to my brother. So, um, yeah. you know, it, it does happen. Um, and I, I just can't imagine. Um, I feel like I prayed my kids into, great, into adulthood, you know, and so now they're uh, 45 and 47. Um, you know, so uh, now I worry about my grandkids all the time. So there you go. But you know, I, I'm really sorry for your loss, but I think that we're all very blessed because you um, did the, the work you did, the research that you did to get the information to find your son. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. You know, it was never my intention to write a book. I would have, Gene, I'd have really re- uh, be- rather been uh, blissfully, blissfully ignorant of all of this, right? I'm so, sure. I am sure. Um, it was just over three years ago. And my son and his friends were all home from uh, college for a Christmas vacation. And uh, and the last weekend before they were all going back to school, they decided to go to a, a buddy's parents' uh, lake house up in Wisconsin. And, and, you know, actually Sally and I were kind of happy with that decision because we figured they'd be in this bucolic country safe, you know, setting, no car driving, no drunk driving, no any of that. And, uh, and, you know, shooting pool. And there were a dozen of them. And at about three o'clock in the morning, my son and, and three of his pals, one who, who we knew real well, um, decided to, uh, jump in a, uh, a three man canoe, four of them with a partially frozen lake and layered clothing and Timberland boots. And they paddled out and none of them made it back. Uh, so that started that started my quest. Yeah. So, what did you do? I mean, can you just kind of give us cliff sure. notes about your search and, and Yeah, you know, sixteen years prior to that, I had I had seen a, a medium, whether you know, spiritual search or curiosity, and it was fine. It was uh, it was fine. You know, the, the most of the reading was pretty mundane and. ADD was kicking in. I was checking my watch, and uh, and 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 all of a sudden, she said to me, "You know, your dad's here, and he's saying, showing me a caboose, and he's saying railroad." Now, if you look over my head, there's a Canadian National Railroad lantern on top of that bookcase. Our family was a railroad family. This was in 2000. This was long before Google searches or anybody's stuff uh, on the internet. And and the old man was just a, a wonderful guy, but it's a blue collar guy, 40 years on the railroad, raised 10 kids. But he was a railroader. He was a union steward. His nickname was Iron Joe. All five of the boys worked on the railroad in college. My uncle Bill was a railroader. My father and my or my grandfather, and my mother said I was a railroader. So we were a railroad family. So this woman, in one sentence, made me a believer. Now, Dad left in kind of a normal time, or you know, early mid seventies, which is a little early, but 
uh, not completely out of character. And right. So I didn't have this need to seek him out or find him because he was where he was supposed to be. And I think all he was doing was giving me a message that said, I'm here. And he, he adored me. I was the youngest. And I think he was just, he didn't give me any life's answers. He didn't tell me, you know, um, about the secrets of the universe. He just, you know, he was just saying, you know, that he was there. Yeah. So fast forward 15, 16 years later, and Christopher drowns. And this kid and I were really connected and loved each other intensely and still do. And so it came to me that if there was a place that my dad was, that my son probably is there too. And how do I get there? What do I do? What are the rules? I need to figure this out. And that's what that that was that's what started this. I started reaching out to a me- that same medium who had since moved to Arizona, and I was just in contact with her a few days ago. So I'm going to Sedona to do some research on the second book. And uh, I'm sailor of the dog for me. And, yeah. uh, Somebody's driving on my street. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, that, that got me looking, thinking I, that if he's there, how do I find him? So I called her literally days after Christopher had crossed over, and she described how he looked. She had never seen him. She mm-hmm. described what they were wearing, what happened. This it wasn't in the newspaper. It wasn't in the newspapers yet. Um, and she told me what that Chris was there, and some uncomfortable things about you know that it was it was it was it wasn't a bad death, but it was scary at first. And crossing over was unusual. And seen a niece of mine, Terry, who had crossed a few years earlier mm-hmm. uh, with an aneurysm at forty two. So all of a sudden, I'm holding on by my fingernails because I now believe in my heart of hearts with evidence from fifteen years before that I can hear from my son and I wanted more. And that's what, that's what prompted the search. Wow. So have you since then maintained a, a somewhat open line of communication with your son? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. We, so what happened was I, 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 I you know, there's Nancy and I, 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 and like all good mediums, you know, your need shouldn't always dictate what's, what's right. And others, she's saying, look, you can't call back every, every week. Right. Nothing change, right. Yeah. You know, save, save your money, you know? And, uh, and so, uh, I, you know, I stayed in touch with her for a couple months and then I really wanted to, now that I believed, I wanted to look in the face of somebody who was looking and my, like, I'm really relieved when we're doing a, a, a zoom like this, when we can look at each other. Right. Exactly. Yes. And, and I wanted to look in the face of a medium who was looking at my son, you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, somebody who's clairvoyant, clear, clear audience, clear visual. I wanted, you know, somebody who could do that. And so I started researching that. And, and Bob Olson has a website and I didn't even realize it that he wrote this amazing book later on. I went to, I read it and, and it was amazing. And I looked up a guy who was local and his name's Andrew Anderson. And he just, uh, you know, and this was now June. I'll tell you, it was June 30th of 2016. And he virtually, I was, I went and saw him and, and I was excited, but I also knew if this didn't work, it was, you know, half hour from my house to my office, big deal. You know, the beat goes on. As the great 20th century philosopher Sonny Bono said, the beat goes on, right? Right. So I went, I went into, but prior to seeing, um, Andrew, I, I had moved Chris from one grave over to another because it looked like he belonged to another couple and I was livid. So I literally moved him over. You know, now I'll occupy that grave. I bought, bought a handful of graves. I occupy that one, but I was damned that people were going to come over and think he was, you know, the Sheridan's kids instead of the mm-hmm. Quillen's kids. So, so I moved him over. And so his, it was, it was, just, they had just done that. So the, do, the, the dirt was looser on his grave. So I'd ordered shamrock seeds. And I, and I went there the morning I was going to go see Andrew and I planted shamrock seeds. And before I left, I went in my drawer in my jewelry case and pulled out a leather bracelet that Christopher gave me when he was four or five from Disney World with Goofy on it and said, Dad, I'm so proud of that. And I hadn't touched that thing, you know, since he, you know, 16 years. So I did that. I planted it, ran off for my meeting with Andrew, walked in and he said, Hey, you know, Christopher is uh, pleased that you guys celebrated his birthday the way he always did, which we did. We take the kids to Japan on their birthday. 
Mm-hmm. And we went to Chris, went to Ryan Japan at Chris's birthday. He said, you, you launched something, a balloon or something that, you know, for his birthday. Well, we launched Chinese lanterns. And he had mm-hmm. a poster of Chinese lanterns on the left. Then he looked at me and said, Christopher acknowledges you're wearing his, Christopher acknowledges wearing his bracelet. Wow. So it was unbelievable. Then he said, Christopher acknowledges that you planted something at his grave today. So it was unbelievable. This was in the first maybe five, ten minutes, Gene, yeah. and I'm getting all of this reinforcement that my son is not only here, but he's willing to communicate with this guy, Andrew, to talk to his old man. Yeah. And and that just that just propelled me farther. He's there. I want to know more. I want to know about, you know, then fast forward to the anniversary of his, of his, of his, of his crossing, which was January 3rd. We crossed since 2016, so this is January 3rd, 2017. I had gotten kind of accustomed to uh, waking up in the middle of the night and uh, 3 o'clock in the morning going to the office and meditating and feeling close. Mm -hmm. Um, But on this date, I I did the whole thing, and there's a routine I have that I just did here where I lit some sage and I I lit a candle and I aligned my chakras, all the things I had no idea. I didn't know anything about these. Yeah. And so I did this, and all of a sudden I started getting messages in my head, and I picked up a pen, and I started writing, and it said, you know, Dad, you're not going to believe this. This is beautiful. This is blue, and it's green, and it's warm, and it's love. But the air is love, but it's love air. And he said, you'll never get understand that till you get here. And I was like, well, I'm just writing. I'm thinking, what the heck's going on here? And then halfway through, he said, this is kind of the evidence that propelled me to know this wasn't me just trying to, you know, just put a salve on my grief. Mm. He said, you got to forgive Scotty. You know, I loved him and he loved me. He was just being himself. You know, it wasn't his fault. Well, what happened, to be honest with you, was Scotty was a kid that Chris grew up with and, and, and they had the lake house and I was a little upset that there was, you know, allowing a bunch of crazy kids to, you know, drink without any any attendance or whatever. But truth of matter is, they were all college kids. They did this every weekend. It wasn't their fault. But I wanted to be mad at somebody, right? So, you know, Chris told me, don't. And then I said, all right, buddy. For you, I won't be mad at Scotty, right? I'll let it go. Figuring, what am I going to worry about that? Well, fast forward 12 hours, 14, 13 hours, we're at the grave, and about 40 of us, neighborhood and college friends showed up for an impromptu celebration of his grave, including teary-eyed Scotty, who just came and embraced me. I mean, my kid was so loving that he was preparing me for this this encounter that, 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 and that I wouldn't act inappropriately. And I, and somebody that he loved, I could open my heart to. And I did. And, and, and you know, so those were the kind of things that said, all right, you know, I'm I wouldn't say I'm a skeptic, but I'm certainly, I spent 25 years in the car business. I was a car dealer. I'm not a naive guy. I'm not an easy sell. And all of a sudden this stuff's happening. And I'm, 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 I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just a convert. I'm in a hundred percent and, and I needed to know what I needed to do more. I mean, I did crazy things like, like this book, which is communicating with spirits, idiot's guide to communicating with spirits, right? Meaning ship for dummies. I love it. Right. I want to. <laughs> I want to know the rules, right? And it turns out subsequently I stumbled on most of this stuff. I mean, like trial and error or just mostly trial and it was right. And then as the more as I researched, the more as I read, it was like, I'm doing all the right things. You know, the chakras, the sage, I was doing stuff to make me feel good. And it turns out that's actually the path to this kind of enlightenment, you know, and connection. So Chris and I, and, and by the way, what happened was I took, Here's a good word for a blue collar kid from Buffalo, New York. I took copious notes during every medium, right? And then later on, I was smart enough, because my wife said so, to, to start recording them on my iPhone. So every me- session I had with medium, I recorded, originally wrote them down. So I had these great notes that I put in a folder. And what I assumed was going to happen, Gene, is that at some point, you know, in the future, I'd be on a rocking chair on a, on a porch, front porch somewhere. And I'd be reading these notes to stay connected to my son. I had no idea that we we're going to become a book. You know, and the Greeks used to say that man plans and gods laugh. You know, yep. but because I, I think 
both God and Christopher knew that this was going to be about a book. And then he's the possibility that the whole contract the two, was to do this. Oh, hundred percent. It was, it was, it was, it was the purpose. You know, none of this, you know, remember you had a plan B, you were going to the neighbor's house, right? Yep. You know, they had a plan B, which was always going to be the first plan anyhow, mm -hmm. which was, I'm going to write a book. And, and it was about, I was a year in. So maybe 14 months after Christopher crossed over, I was listening to, I was in my office listening to Sally talk to her brother about how tenacious Christopher when he was playing hide and seek. And, and it made me cry to be honest. He would say hide again in a little two year old voice and then take off and hide under their laundry basket or in a closet. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you'd stumble on him and he'd go hide again and he'd go take off. And so all of a sudden I, you know, I'm smiling, walk up to my office and I think, and I just, turned around my computer and wrote hide again, my search for Christopher on the other side, because I need, same way I need to find him when he was playing hide and seek, I need to find him now. You know, and by the way, Gene, if it was all BS, if this was hokey, I wanted to know it, just cross it off. You sure. know what I mean? I, I'm okay with, I'm a big boy. You know, if I'm wrong, if this isn't the direction, what is? You know, so I'd find the next thing. But this certainly was the, the path that I needed to take. Well, and, you know, my belief system is that the soul never dies. You know, we just, we're, we're information gathering machines and we come into physical form to do two things. One, gather information to help us master our life plan, whatever that lesson is. And number two, to help people on the other side. Because in form, you can do, you can make a request for the other side and it actually happens faster than uh, someone who's on the other side because they don't have the physical aspect. That's right. my belief. They, Chris can't write this book. Right. But there's two things happening. One is I'm being of service. Mm -hmm. I, you know, the old man is 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 doing his bid. And I'm In being such a huge way, Joe. I don't think you have right. even any comprehension well, about how big this service is. And, and I stay, and because of this, I get to stay connected to my son. You know, so to me, it's a, it's a huge win. You know, it's people say it's like having a second job. And I'd say, you know what? The greatest job, people would come to me when Christopher passed, when he crossed over, and they would say, I'm so sorry. And I, well, being, you know, sarcastic, I'd say, look, I got to be his father for 25, 21 years on this side, forever on the other side. I got to have the greatest job in the world. So don't feel sorry for me. You know, I got 21 years. I, I would have loved another 50 years with him, you know, but I wasn't going to make it, but, but he would. Yeah. But, but either way, I got, I got 21 amazing years of love and connection and commitment. So nobody needs to feel sorry for me. Well, I have to ask you. So I know that this communication that you've had has really helped to heal your heart and helped you in so many ways. But coming from the woman's perspective, has it helped your wife as well? My wife's amazing. She's a therapist, right? And mm -hmm. she's writing a book also. And, and, um, yeah, we hear this is, that's a great, a great question, Jean, because 75% of the people who lose kids don't make it in a marriage. They think, right. right? And, and, and we're closer than we've ever been. I, I, you know, you know, she took my breath away the first time I saw her, and it, and it hasn't changed a lot, you know. And I punted my coverage on that one. I know in every, every, in every relationship, somebody gets the bargain, and, yeah. and this one I did. But we healed completely different. Mm -hmm. she, sure. shut, she shut down for six months, right? And, and my little, and my son, William, very similarly, you know, kind of shut down, right? He, he was unreachable. My sister-in-law shut down for 18 years, and yeah. my brother told me that he said, you know, I haven't had a chance to grieve our child's death because all of my energy has gone to keeping my wife alive. Yeah, in one piece. You know what? She, uh, and and I, I, I grieve in an entirely different way. I mean, my grief is that I would run around in circles. Uh, getting as much done, doing as much, uh, go play golf, play hockey, work for 10 hours, get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. And and then obviously then this project with Chris, but I would run around in circles till 
there was no energy left that I would pass out. And, and my, my, my Caroline, who's a senior and, and going to graduate from Marquette this year, did it like me. You know, she'd run around socially in college and mm. so that we didn't have to, I don't know, let the pain in. Right. But it always finds a way. It finds a way in. So, Sally, we just respected each other's grief process. Mm-hmm. And, and we'll never be out of it. I really equate it to waking up where I assume how an amputee wakes up every morning and doesn't realize that they've lost a limb until they, they're fully conscious. I wake up mornings, to be honest with you, and forget some mornings that he's gone, mm-hmm. that he crossed. And then it's like, oh, oh you know, oh, shite. <laughs> you know, he is gone, you know. And, and, and so it never leaves you as, I'm sure your, your, your brother can, can attest to, you know, it never leaves. I think we have better tools to cope with it. Yeah. You know, I mean, a song, I'm, I'm going to a fundraiser for the school that he was involved with in Balance Ranch. I get a chance. I'm in recovery 33 years. I've been sober 33 years. Mm-hmm. So I go to the fundraiser and we do a golf outing and they're, they're involved. They get half and they show up and they were just a wonderful. And, and it's a school for boys with addiction between 14 and 18. Mm-hmm. And then I drive down to the school itself, to the ranch, which, and they just put up uh, new student housing and, and it's named McQuillan Manor after Christopher. Mm-hmm. And so I go down and I talk to all the boys between there's 30 and 40 boys that I'll have a one-on-one with them for being an hour, hour and a half, you know, and it's, it's such a rewarding time. And it's such an amazing time for me that I can connect with those boys and do some service, mm-hmm. you know, and, and something good's going to come out of, you know, we can't change if something bad happened. That I can't undo that no matter how much I want to, you know, but, you know, I got to tell you, he prompts me to do, to do, I really wasn't thinking I wanted to go to the, the fundraiser the third year in a row. And, and I got a message from him and he said, go to the fundraiser, Bob, you know, you need to do service. Mm-hmm. That's, that's so cool. And I think that's one of the things, Joe, that most people don't realize is that if you develop your skills, hone those skills, all of us can do this. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, the best, the best, the best mediums in the world tell you you're not going to need me. I still go to mediums because I love, I haven't been blessed with, with a clear audience, right? I, I don't, I, 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 you know, go to clear voice, excuse me. I don't see, I really want to see him in the worst way and I'm working on the skills and maybe it's going to be withheld. I don't know. That's up to God and Chris, I guess, probably boss, you know? No, just keep waiting because I'll tell you what, it'll happen when you least expect it and it will yeah. happen in a way that you won't expect. Yeah. I, many years ago, I wanted to see Archangel Michael because he's like yeah. my guide and teacher and I kept asking, please let me see you and I would meditate, I would do this, that and the other, turn around three times, bend over, touch my toes, nothing worked and I never saw him and I went down for um a funeral, one of my relatives, my brother and I went together and when we were coming home, uh, he was driving my car and I was just bored stiff looking out the window and a transfer truck passed us on the right. He was obviously not driving fast enough in the fast lane. Right, right, and the right, car right. passed us on the right and I just happened to look over at it and it was in, it was a beautiful, almost like a, a Renaissance painting. Um, with gold around the edges of Archangel Michael with his big sword. And across it, it said, Archangel Michael, please protect our drivers. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, you know, and I doubt anybody else saw that same transfer truck. And I'm pretty sure I'll never see it again. Right, but, right. you know, that was the answer to my question. Yeah. I wanted to see him. And so yeah. he showed himself to me. And I'm hoping, you know, I, we, I spend a lot of time at the grave and not in some sad, maudlin way. I'm not like some old man in the park feeding pigeons, right? right? And I've been told by Thomas John, who's a, a pretty impressive cat, you know, really good medium. And I, and I saw him in person. He said, you know, he, after he knocked my socks off with some validation, he said, do you go to the grave all the time? And I said, yeah, I do. He said, like, were you there? When? I said, yesterday. He said, all right. He said, now, most parents, I tell them, don't go there. Your kids aren't there. You know, mm-hmm. that's just a, it's just a spot of ground. He said, I'm going to tell you, the energy is so good at that place. Keep going there. Chris loves it when you go there and you guys meet there. It's a, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't abide there. You know, that's not where he lives, right? He, right? he travels there to meet you. And, and, and we, and we meet there and we have this great communication. 
And so I'm hoping that as I'm meditating, looking at, I look out into the, 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 the trees and I envision what it was when he would come through the airport coming home when he was away. And I'd be waiting for him at the, at, at the gate, at the American Airlines gate. And I'd see him come through the glass security doors. And that's how I envision him. Now, I haven't seen him. That's in my mind's eye only. But I'm hoping someday when I'm looking, you know, I'll actually see him. That'll be a gift. You know. But I also got to tell you, you know, I'm the youngest of 10 kids. I was a little spoiled, right? I've got to be grateful for what I'm given. If I'm never given, you know, uh, you know, clairvoyance, I'm given this ability to see or listen, hear, smell, feel my son, you know, and, and, and you're right. You know, I, I got a call from a woman on a radio show who said, you know, and, and she was a skeptic and, and the host said, well, what do you tell people who, you know, you know, have never had the connection? I said, try harder. What are you doing to open up that, that door, right? That portal. Try harder. Work harder. Work on your end. Raise your spiritual energy. You got it. You got it. I mean, the whole thing with the book. You remember the book, The Secret, that came out back then? Yeah. It was a big woman's movement, but I happened to have loved it. And it, and it, it really kind of changed me in little ways. And, and, and one of the things that they talk about is that you got to go first with the universe. You know, yeah. the universe, you know, and even in, even in, in Matthew, it talks about that all you need is a mustard seed of faith, right? Mm-hmm. And then the rest of it gets opened up, right? But, you, but, but the even rest that of that is ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and, knock and the door shall be open. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, and I, I completely agree. So if you're unsuccessful in connecting with somebody you love, take a little responsibility yourself and get better at this. Yeah. Research, read, meditate, learn something. I mean, I don't know. You know, I was at a festival, kind of one of these spiritual festivals. I was looking at drums, right? I haven't beat a drum, but if beating a drum would bring me closer to my son, I'll get a friggin' drum. You know, whatever's going to allow me to get closer, I'm doing. You know, and I would suggest that just ask your son. Yeah. You know, let him tell you. Good point. Right. Right. Yeah. He's pretty brilliant. He comes through pretty strong. He's, and so we still, you know, Four times a month or so, I'll, I'll, I'll wake up at three o'clock, just boom. And, uh, you know, I'll, okay. you know, now has he, has he shared with Good. you by any chance about, um, you know, at some point in time, he's going to give to be given another job. And so has he, has he shared with you about that possibility? And, um, I'm told right now what he's doing from him and from mediums is that his job is to help any young kids who have crossed, who, 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 who are in shock, who are in hurt, who are damaged by the, you know, by what happened prior to getting there and crossing. Mm-hmm. And he was always like a Pied Piper for kids on this side. Uh, kids adored him. And he was beautiful. He was a, he was a, a he, you know, he was a, a wild colonial boy, that one. But he had this tenderness and gentleness and the kids just they'd be crawling all over. So I've been told by mediums who've never met him, don't know anything about him, that that's what he's doing. And actually, mm-hmm. used, I've had three mediums use the term Pied Piper for kids. I love it. That's his yeah. job now. And I'm hoping, you know, and the nice thing is, from what I'm told, the research is that he's not taking away from his job to spend time with his old man. Oh, no. So they no, no, work no. Out this stuff. They can do whatever they want to do, you know. They get Wednesdays and weekends off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they get an early Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, Joe, tell people about your book. How can they get it? How can they find out more about you? Okay, so... Um, the book is my search for Christopher on the other side. Pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. It's 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 on Amazon.com. I've got it in print. I've got it in 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 Audible. Um, you know, uh, you can download it to your computer. You know, so it's Kindle. Um, it really is. And for anybody, it, and the book is written. And Christopher, if you read the book is through it, continues to say things like, "Come on, Pop, you can't go into a shell. You got to help people." And it's like. You know, you're, you know, you're, you're losing momentum. Get going, you know. And I'd go see a medium and the medium who had met me before would say, Chris says you're writing a book. How far are you along? Because he really wants you to get moving on it. So, um, the, here's the crazy thing. The book got written, you know, Christopher crossed in, in January 2016. I started writing the book in April or so of 2017. I was done by Father's Day because he told me it had to be done by Father's Day of 2018. Mm-hmm. 
It was published by Thanksgiving weekend 2018. That doesn't happen. Right. It doesn't. It's a hag in this amazing um, publisher got her arms around it because he gets around. He shanghai's people. You got to be careful. He might shanghai you. You might be involved in this project before you know it because mm -hmm. he does that. You know, I'm speaking at Book Soup in Hollywood in June. Are you kidding me? You know, Spike Lee's there this month, right? Yeah. But the thing is, it's not me. It's me giving a message that Chris gave me, right? Think about conversations with God, but your kid telling you, yeah, right? Exactly. It's a wonderful. So that's what the book, that's where the, the, the book's available. The book really is, if you have any inclination to reach somebody you love, it doesn't have to be a kid, but it seems to be a pretty mm -hmm. significant part of the, of the society needs this. Now, specifically men, because somehow you guys are given permission. You know, women are given permission to process, feel, you know, share, melt. And guys are supposed to, you know, march around like... like suck it up. Suck it up, buttercup, right? Uh -huh. and, and you know what? And I'm kind of a boots-on-the-ground kind of guy, so it's... You could take... And by the way, I have a mini breakdown every day. At some point every day, I'm crying, and then I just let it overtake me like a tide, and then I get back to do what I'm doing. Because that's how much... Look, I love this kid. And, and and I'm not looking for that to stop because that, I know the connection's there. You know, I miss him physically so much. But I also have the skips of knowing that we're there and we're connected. He's here right now. I can feel oh, yeah. when I get a tingle on the back of my neck, I know it's him. He's just a finger breadth away from you. Yeah, you know? yeah. I, 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 and and we've, all, we've always been able to be in the same room and just be. I mean, literally, even as even when he was a bad teenager, you know, and, and, you know, and we could just love each other and be, you know, we didn't have to say anything, you know, and, and so um, we probably talk more now than we did when he was around, but we were really, really close, you know, so, you know, that's the book. I have a website that's called mysearchforchristopher.com. My email is, is my, my first name is Joe. My middle initial is B McQuillan, so JB McQuillan at Gmail. If listeners want to reach out, Somebody's lost something. Got a question. You know what? Email me, man. I'm pretty sure there's somebody out there who just heard that. And I'm happy. That's that's. This is you know I'm round in third now, Gene. You know this is I'm on the last lap, but I'm happy, right? I, I had I had the greatest run that anybody's ever had, and when this thing ends on this side, I get to go spend the next run with him. So I, you know, I'm not done. I've got this book has to get out there, and a lot of people. It's got to be a movement. I've got two kids, you know, one's finishing college and the other's 19 to raise. You know, I've got a wonderful wife. So I've got work to do. I'm not ready to go. But if God tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, sport, time to go. You know, it's like, you know, I've, okay. I've lived life beyond my wildest dreams and I know where I'm going. Yeah, you know, exactly. In the book, Gene, that we're in boot camp. Now, boot camp can be, you know, enjoyable. When I was a kid in high school, I played football. We'd have... We, we, a week we did three a day practices and we loved it it was wonderful it was a lot of work and then he said dad you're in boot camp and I'm in a beach house in Maui right so how you know, that and, and that's a great way to end our show we're out of time Joe thank you so much for joining us tonight this I, I think some of this information has been invaluable for the viewers so I really appreciate it so y'all get his book my search for Christopher on the other side on the other side and um, and join me again next week. My guest next week is going to be Karen Upal and she is all about finding your passion and, um, and, and setting a light under it. I and, found mine. Yes. And, and really she's all about getting free. So um, yeah. And okay. until next time, remember people who take responsibility for their lives create the reality they desire. Much love to you all. Ciao.